Greeting viewers. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are located. Um, thank you for joining us. We hope that you are well and that you have had a wonderful week. Columbia Global Centers Nairobi in collaboration with Columbia Alumni Association warmly welcomes all our guests this evening, particularly Columbia students who are the majority of our audience today to part two of our episode on Colombia in the continent, alumni in action. In this forum, Columbia University students, particularly those who are from Africa, will listen and interact with some members of the alumni community. They will learn about their experiences outside college and how they've been able to establish their careers, their businesses or hustles, as we like to call it. For the sake of our new audience members, let me add that Columbia Global Centers Nairobi is part of nine regional hubs positioned around the world by Columbia University to facilitate regional collaborations um, between Columbia faculty and students and alumni with our regional partners. We have a dynamic panel today consisting of members of Columbia University alumni. And in the interest of time, um, I will highlight a few interesting facts about them, but we will post their extended bios um, on the chat section. First, we have Amboi Chege, who is a seasoned advisory and services professional with experience in international and private sector development in Sub-Saharan Africa, the US and Asia. Anuli Isiche is a social impact leader and a registered nurse with extensive experience supporting, supporting multiple sectors, including education, nonprofits, and healthcare. Tomiwa Aledekomo is the CEO of Big Cabal Media, which publishes the tech and youth publications, Tech Cabal and Zikoko. Big Cabal is building the next generation of African media brands and creating some of the most exciting original content from the continent. We all agree that our alumni are simply doing some amazing things. And at some point we should be able to source for services and for all our needs for growth and development in-house. I'm looking forward to that. Our moderator this evening is Frank Mugiso a junior at Columbia College who is studying computer science. So before we get started, kindly note that this program is being recorded. And as we proceed, kindly remember to post your questions under the Q&A section. Remember to follow us on social media so that you can stay updated on our upcoming programs. We will be posting our social media handles on the chat section. I would now like to hand over to Frank to take it from here. Frank, are you both? Welcome. Yeah, th thank you very much uh, for, your, for your presence and you know, for speaking to us here at AEG. Uh, for us, um, talking to alumni is always uh, great and valuable because uh, many of our members are planning to go back to African continents in order to have an impact. Because, uh, you know, the way we always see ourselves, that's like, uh, we can have an impact here in America, but then uh, in Africa, the impact would be look so much, so much greater. Like even a small effort that you make over there will be, you know, much more valuable over there. And so it's always great, you know, for us to speak to alumni uh, and also to, to speak to speak to people like you who have done amazing jobs on the continent. And so um, you know, I'm going to get started uh, immediately with, with the questions. And uh, first, like the first part of our, our uh, conversation today is just going to start with, um, like, so, so first I, I wanted to know, like, um, like I, I would like the, uh, you to share about your beginnings, your beginnings, like how, like how did you like transition from college and also like actually how, what did you study in college and like what's influenced the decision to like choose 
what you decided to study in college? I'm happy to go first. Good morning or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are once again. Um, Frank, thank you for your question. Um, so I have a very uh, maybe interesting academic journey. Um, I started off, I did public health, and then I went and did an accelerated um, nursing degree. So it was one year I got my bachelor's in nursing. And really what precipitated that is both of my grandmothers were nurses um, and they were nurses in Nigeria, but they had, they were non-traditional nurses. And that kind of what is what made me start thinking, you know, maybe nursing is a good start and then I'll kind of branch off in another way. But um, my grandmother was the first nurse in Nigeria actually to have um, a bachelor's degree. And from there, she went on to start a hospital, started a nonprofit. Um, she did a lot of very, um, she wasn't just a bedside nurse, um, essentially. And that's kind of what I did. So I, you know, I, I did my degrees. Um, after about a year or so of um, practicing as a clinical nurse, I started a global health initiative, which was focused on um, providing accessible um, diabetes education to a a target population that wasn't really reached, which was the ages of 18 through 25, excuse me. And through that initiative, I was able to get the hospital that I worked at in New York to um, fund and donate some of our medical mission trips to Nigeria. And that kind of just was a catalyst for me um, in deciding to move back. So that's kind of just my early career journey. Um, and it was, again, like I said, very non-traditional, but it was inspired by um, the role models that I had. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, um, I can go next. Um, um, good evening, good afternoon, everyone as well. Um, so um, I'm in Nairobi at the moment. And um, so I'm Kenyan. Yeah, and to answer Frank's question, my journey has also been, been, been really interesting and different. So I started out, I grew up in Kenya, born in Kenya, raised in Kenya, did my first degree in Kenya, which was a Bachelor of Commerce at one of the uh, national universities here. And I then worked for Reuters um, for a couple of years, many years, uh, about seven years um, when I finished. Uh, part of it was very little in Kenya, um, I left Kenya very quickly and moved to Tanzania as the Reuters correspondent. And I was a young girl then, um, hadn't left home ever. So this was my first foreign assignment. And I think, I just think it was really courageous of me to do it. I think I was either 25 or 26 when I did it. And I was covering the country alone. Um, and then moved to South Africa, which was the regional bureau. Um, and while in South Africa, um, those were really interesting times in, um, on the continent, Thabo Mbeki was president and he really inspired, um, like you wanted to do something for the continent. So I just thought I want to, I was doing a lot of financial markets reporting. So reporting on companies, mergers and acquisitions, that's always been my area of interest, finance. And um, I thought, why don't I go back to school and do something that will then enable me to come back to the continent because Kenya was going through a transition at the time. So moving from single party to multi-party and um, we were moving from a long-term dictatorship to new government. And I was really hoping actually to come back and work in the government. And initially when I moved to South Africa, the idea was to do my master's at Wits University, do an MBA. Um, then, in between all that and my interest in policy work, I decided let me um, go to the US um, with um, um, Najim from my brother who was already doing his, his master's at the time. And, and so that's how come I, I came to Colombia. Um, so Colombia accepted me and um, my first time in the US, first time in, yeah, it was, it was a bit, it was really interesting for me, but I was also an older student doing her master's because I was around 32 when I, when I, when I joined. And so it, that, that was also a very different experience for me. Um, when I finished, I had the opportunity to either come back or stay in, um, in, 
different roles in, in the US and, and even maybe moved to London. But what happened was that the first job that I signed and that came back to me with an offer, the first organization. So I had IFC, um, I had Citibank and I had Starbucks where I had worked as a barista just immediately after finishing school. And they really liked me and they were like, oh, why don't you come and work? Um, you know, head office in Seattle and um, come and do CSR work. I said, oh yeah, that's an interesting thought. But I already had my offer from, 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 um, from IFC and IFC recruited me to come back to Africa. So that's how I, I came back to Africa. And I didn't have a problem because um, I wanted to go back home um, and, and it was not a difficult decision for me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi. So um, I have, uh, again, another interesting journey. Um, born and raised in Nigeria, and I moved to the US for my first degree. Ended up spending about 10 years in the US. I uh, did a uh, first degree uh, in business administration. I, I minored in finance and then in advertising. Oh, I had a focus in finance, but minored in advertising. Um, the result of an internship, my first finance internship, where I made lots of money, but realized I wasn't going to be doing that for, for a living. Um, and um, after I finished, I started working in ad agencies. I worked in market research and scope related spaces. Ended up doing a master's at Columbia in anthropology because a lot of work in marketing was rooted in anthropology at the time. Um, and then through that all the way, I went to work for Atlantic Records as one does. Um, so an even more scattered sort of, uh, I think, educational and then professional background than some of the ones that we've heard. Um, I moved back to Nigeria in 2008, kicking and screaming. Uh, my work visa had expired. And uh, despite my company's best efforts to uh, sponsor one, that didn't work out for me. Um, and so I moved to Nigeria, not quite ready to be here, but um, you know, I promised myself I wouldn't do anything drastic when I moved back to Nigeria. And um, yeah, over the last few years, I have built a career for myself. I've done a similarly complex mix of things um, to get to where it is I am right now, which is running a digital media startup. Um, but I'm sure there'll be more questions about that in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for your explanation. And also, uh, I wanted to maybe to follow up a little bit uh, with uh, one boy and Anoli, maybe. I, I wanted to know, like, uh, why why like did you decide to go home like because well um you, you mentioned that you you had an offer from ifc but like, what was the other motivation was it just like the um was it just the, the fact that you had a, an offer from ifc or like what's what motivated you to want to go back home yeah i mean i think it's partly that so to be honest i am pretty mobile in my life and i don't I don't have roots as such. I mean, I'm back in Nairobi after being away home from home for 16 years. I came back in 2014 and I have to say this is the longest I have ever stayed anywhere. Because before that, I always moved every three years, every two years, every one year. Um, so I knew that even if I was going back and I was going back to South Africa, which is where I'd lived before, um, I knew that I could go anywhere else in the world. So for me, the world has always been my oyster. I never, I, I don't lock myself into situations. So um, what my sister was in the country um, and I like the work, that I, the, the opportunity, the work, the job that I, the job offer that I had. Um, I always wonder, having said that, I always wonder, for example, what would have happened if I had stayed in the US and, um, and done those maybe first couple of five, 10 years working because I'm, I probably might not, not have come back or I would have come back um, to the continent much, much later. I think that's what would have happened. Uh, my brother is there and he's, he's, he's really not about to come back. So it's, 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 and I really had no resistance to coming back home. I was very open. I was very open. Um, and, and I did get an opportunity later to go back to the US and work. Um, and I lived in DC and I loved it. I was thriving. I really enjoyed it. So 
I think it's just good to keep an open mind. That's that's my very personal opinion. And 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 when I look at my life and and even listening to Anuli and Tomiwa, I think more and more Africans now need more of us just need to accept that we are global citizens and we can be our home is home of course is always where your heart is but you're allowed to have a leg in america and a leg in africa you're allowed to have a leg in asia and a leg in africa you know and and i i that's what i would say so now i have nieces and they're applying to schools and I'm telling them, you know, just, just the world is your oyster. Go spread your wings and do what you want. And some of them really want to come back home and, and immediately after. And I'm like, actually, no, if you can try and work overseas because it also really adds value when you come back home. Um, you also have a very different perspective uh, to things. So I would just say, consider yourself a global citizen. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. And also, like, uh, I had another question. Um, and that question is uh, for everybody. That's, uh, I wanted to know, like, you know, by the time that you, know, you decided to go back home, uh, like, how did you, because I know that in Africa, there is always this expectation that, you know, if you went to the US, you know, you should be, you know, some people are like, you shouldn't come back, you know, like the society has, you know, expectations about you. And you also have expectations about yourself because you've been here, maybe you've, you've seen and you kind of have an idea of like what you want. Uh, like how do, how do you like manage those kind of expectations when you go back home? Because when you go back home, the society will have some expectations to know that like, oh, are you crazy? Like you were in the US and then you just came, you came back, like why, why are you doing that? And like also, um, yeah, just, you know, just uh, uh, like how did you like navigate us? Uh, society, society expectations, and also like the family expectations. Um, okay, I'll, I can take that first. I think it's interesting. Um, there's the expectation that with foreign education, you will come and you will do exceedingly well. Um, I think for the smartest people, they do. If you get a job in your home country while you're in the US or, or wherever it is, you're able to sort of, you know, secure a much higher paying job, you know, can, you know kind of get like an expat package and get yourself like imported back. Uh, some of us didn't do that. Um, in fact, like my first uh, attempt at uh, settling was to become an entrepreneur almost immediately, which turned out to be an error because one of the things that's required for an entrepreneur is deep, to be successful is deep local knowledge of customs, you know, a network of people, et cetera. And so um, I would say effectively I played myself um, in that way because um, I think there's a bit of arrogance in like you've learned, you've worked in a global context, you've had global experiences and you think that should give you an edge. And it does to a certain extent, but um, there was a lot of sort of like local nuance and local expertise I just didn't have and had to build over time. Um, in terms of the expectations of other people, I don't know that I had too much of a weight of that. I think my family expected me to succeed. And certainly your families will expect you to, to make much higher paychecks. Uh, various people face different pressures. I don't have a significant amount of the black tax, um, as, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. So I'm not supporting family extensively. Uh, but if you move back and uh, a family has struggled really hard to pay for your education somewhere else, then you're going to have... I mean, that tends to restrict your options because uh, the kind of foolhardy jumping into entrepreneurism and like having a, a rough few years while I figured it out is the kind of thing that you can't do if there are people really depending on you. And so I think different people have different circumstances, but you'll find, um, yeah, I, I, you now you now give them the best of the tools that you have. Oh, that was just cool. Um. So that's a great question. Um, and my answer is probably a mix of Frank's and Wambui's um, answers. But um, as far as um, deciding to come back home, I'm slightly different. So I was born and raised in the US. Um, however, I traveled back to Nigeria so frequently, like I had friends, I had family, I had a very strong network. So 
when I decided that I was going to move back, um, I remember a lot of my family members saying, oh, you go for Christmas, like Christmas and moving back are very different. <laughs> like, oh, I don't know what you're deciding to do, but just, you know, I said, okay, I'll use my internship. Um, SIPA requires um, everyone to do an internship. I said, okay, here's my summer inter internship as a litmus test. Let me see, you know, if, you know, I like this, you know, this, I'll use it as a test and see, do I, will I enjoy it? Um, is it something I could really do? So I got an internship in Nigeria. Um, and this is, of course, after the many years of going back and forth, you know, doing work there, but now actually living there. Um, I was there for three months and I enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved the work. I loved, you know, the people that I met. And they actually offered me a job after I was done. They said, you know, if you want to come back, you know, we'll have a position for you, you know, next year. And so I thought about it. And much like what Wambui said, I thought to myself, well, no one's going to take my passport, right? You know, if I go there and I don't like it, I'll just come back. Maybe that I have, as, um, as told me what has said, everybody has different circumstances. So I was able to leverage the fact that I'm a citizen of both countries. And I thought, okay, well, I can, nobody's going to stop me if I decide I want to come back. And I enjoyed it. I was there for five years. I just moved back to the US, although I still do a lot of work in Nigeria now. Um, and to what Tomiwa said about setting yourself up. So I agree completely. I don't think not I don't think, but I think it's wise to go back to work and then maybe really understand what the issues are that you're trying to address if you're going to be an entrepreneur. I think that's just the smartest way because sometimes, you know, with book knowledge, you think, oh, I know everything that these people need, when in actuality, there's a lot of nuances, there's a lot of context, you know, interacting with people, you get a better sense of actually that's not really what they need like now that I've you know been there on the on the forefront I kind of have an idea so I think it's it's very wise to actually go back and work first before if you want to take the entrepreneurial route um and as Tomiwa said as well negotiate from abroad I think it's a lot easier <laughs> um, and that's what I did I negotiated from abroad you know um a lot easier to you know maybe make forex or to make more money or to that expat um, package than it is once you've landed there. Um, so that would be um, my advice. But yes, the world is your oyster. Don't feel limited. And I don't think I didn't have that pressure. Like people said, I had people saying, "Why are you going back?" But at the end of the day, it's your decision, right? It's your life, um, and nobody else going to live it for you. So I think the same way that many of you may have left your home countries to now come to Colombia is the same decision that you have to personally make if you decide that you want to go back. Um, and just think about the long run and what you're looking to accomplish. Yeah. Um, so interesting for me as well, because even if I came back to the continent, I was listening to Nuni speaking and thinking, I actually, I did not come back home. Home for me is Kenya. Um, I went from New York to South Africa, to Johannesburg, which is my second home. So in terms of thinking about home, actually, um, I only came back home in 2014. And that was a really interesting experience for me because I've been away for so long and most of my growing up years, I was not home. And so I came back with a job, uh, both instances, but I think coming back to Kenya, most importantly, it was, I was fortunate that I came back with a job uh, because then it really helped me um, get used and understand Kenya, considering that I'd left Kenya, I don't know, in 19, many, many, many years ago. So, and a lot had changed. My friends had moved on. It was a very, very different life. Um, I've never had anybody ask me, why did you decide to come back home? Um, that's never been an issue for me. But one thing I do know is that um, a lot of my early career choices were also determined uh, by the fact that I needed to earn well, make enough money for myself and make enough money to support my family. Because I am the eldest. Um, and, and, and for a long time, 
I, I um, almost into my mid to late thirties, I supported my family. So um, yeah, those were my, my decisions, a lot of them. I've, I've been able to take risk now, much later in life. And that's because, um, uh, because I can now. Yeah, everyone is settled. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and like that was actually a nice transition to like the next question I had, which is uh, like, you know, I also wanted to know like, like how, like what's kind of, you know, challenges you face as like new professionals in Africa? Because I, I know that, you know, as, a, as an example, you know, there is, there is a time that uh, I, I just went home for, for this, like this winter break, I was home, I was, you know, doing a, some form of internship. And I remember there was one day that I was supposed to meet someone and, uh, I asked them, I asked a person who I think was supposed to be at 2 p.m. and the person showed up at 3 p.m. And, you know, I, I just wanted to know, like, is there like, any such challenges that you faced as like, young professionals? And like, how, like, how do you deal with that when, when you were working on content? I want to go on this one. <laughs> Kenya stories that are just like weird. <laughs> I've had it. <laughs> so, um, okay, so here's the thing. First of all, you 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 are living abroad and then you come back, you 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 keep your connection to your country because you come back home every year or every other year. So in my case, I came back a lot often, both for work and, and, and for home. But when I came to leave and to work, so I had never worked in an all Kenyan firm. So that was a culture shock for me. And, and I have, and all my life I had worked in, in, in always multicultural environments and, and, and real global entities. So, and, and diverse, even when I'm working with Africans, I'm working with other Africans. So I come back, first of all, you're being hired because of your tribe. Secondly, your people are speaking to you in their mother tongue, in your mother tongue, and you're wondering, how is this okay? It's not okay. And then you're labeled because you say, I don't want to talk back to you in Kikuyu, please, can you speak English? I mean, this is the official language. I mean, Kenya has such tribalist, tribalism issues that really, it's just wrong for me to speak in my mother tongue in the office. So just little sensitivities, tease like like that time i um yeah time is always a challenge uh, but nairobi is a bit special in that sense um i have been pleasantly surprised though and i'm gonna say this i think kenyans are fantastic um really talented and very very hard working so that for me is what has has really impressed me the young people are really, really, really great, really hardworking. They run with things when you, when you work with them. And actually, for me, my whole thing is how do you mentor people? How do you inspire people to, to do more and to do better and to aim high for themselves and not think so little and aim so low, like, like really, really ambitious. Um, and I feel that if they just had the same opportunity, for example, that I had, they would just fly. So that is my passion um, for me. And, and, and I would say, yeah. So you, you experience the reverse culture shock. And um, yeah, I have friends who keep telling me, you know, you have to get used to the way, these are the way things are done in Kenya. I think you also have to, to, to have a, a certain, maintain a, a certain standard. And a lot of it is a very personal integrity standard because for example, even here, corruption is huge and it's not just in government, it's, it's in the way you work and in the way you engage, it's in the way you keep your promises, not keep your word, it's, it's in little, finding shortcuts in little things. And I think you have to make a, a very personal decision about what your value system is going to be and, 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 and who you're going to be and how you're going to, con going to conduct yourself at work. And also realizing that you have a lot of privilege and so, one thing I found is um, you can be that person who like, I have lived abroad and so I'm very special or I have lived abroad and I, that's privilege and I would like to support you in your dream. And I think I wanna be the latter always.
um, I think Wan Bui makes a lot of like really important points. Uh, for me, I've got some slightly different considerations. I think there are lots of everyday challenges that are quite frustrating and it's everything from petty corruption to a different kind of work ethic or different expectations in the workplace. Um, some harmful, some less so. Um, there's some just acclimatizing that's just, it's a different culture. And the truth of the matter is you've been in the West, it's super liberal, you call your professors by name, you know, then you move back to the continent and like respect's a big thing in many places, you can't call other people by their names. And so you have to adapt to things like that. Um, I think for me, the more substantial challenges are things like, um, okay, so I'm an entrepreneur, which I've mentioned, uh, or I've come back to entrepreneurism after you know, my, my first initial rough bout with that. Um, and so I run my own company and I think about how hard uh, we've worked over the last few years. And um, it's not a market that's deep, as deep as the US. Um, and the US is a very special market, which I think people who live in it, America is so big that it seems like the world to a lot of people in America. Uh, but um, when you operate in other markets, you start to realize how truly exceptional and unusual the US market is. And so the amount of effort it takes to build something and build something big in other parts of the world is not quite the same. The converse of that though, is that you can build things that have meaning. You can build things that are one of one. You can build things that should exist, but nobody has taken the trouble to build or has had the imagination or the capacity to build. And so that is wonderful, that opportunity to be a fire starter, to be a front leader, and uh, to solve problems that nobody else is solving. So that's, that's tremendous. I would say for me, and I think for many people, the biggest, biggest and most frustrating challenge with Africa is the fact that on a systems level, we just haven't got it right. And so from a governance perspective, from an engagement with the world in substance perspective, there's just so much less left for us to do. And so I think for those coming home, I mean, these are some of the things that you do have to think about. And this that's, for me, who lives on the continent, it's one of those things where you're frustrated by the lack of progress, despite all the talent. And so, you know, when we talked about, like, just how hardworking people are, how capable people are. And I mean, if you look at Nigerians around the world, we are top of the top. Like, I mean, like, you know, uh, Asians are supposed to be the model minority. But if you look at rankings like Nigerians are right at the top in terms of education in terms of professional achievement anywhere but in Nigeria you know well I mean even in Nigeria we excel academically and we have you know a range of really great business professionals but the country is still in the basket case um, that's not accomplishing anywhere near what it should and isn't playing the role it should on the continent or globally that's immensely frustrating for me immensely challenging it is still the area of opportunity in the sense that we will not fix the continent. And that's everywhere from Kenya to Nigeria to South Africa, which is kind of trending in all most of the wrong directions. Um, none of these countries will be fixed without a significant input of capacity and experienced leadership and principled and capable leadership and people who just have a vision and can move a vision in the right direction. Um, one of my frustrations as an entrepreneur is the sense that I'm applying my skills in the wrong place, that without solving the fundamental challenges of the society, without fixing our governance and fixing the direction of the country, that essentially the things you are doing are a little bit futile. So when I talk about business risks to my business, one of the biggest risks is, is our macroeconomic conditions, you know, like what is the economy doing? So no matter how brilliant as an entrepreneur I am, no matter how great my team, no matter how innovative our products, if people can afford them, there is no business. And so when you look at the current Nigerian government, which has spent eight years decimating the economy and making all the wrong choices, it's like, well, you know, should you have spent the time within that period trying to build something in the private sector or should you have gone into government and just tried to shake at least one thing into the right direction or shape one thing in the right direction. Um, and so I think the challenge, I mean, for definitely our generation, and sort of a generation of Africans on and off the continent is to figure out how to engage with our systems, how to engage with our politics and our governance and how to actually push the continent in the right direction or whatever countries you're from. Um, I think that's a really, really key challenge that we need to face up to. 
Um, Mewa kind of just literally took the words out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> leadership and governance is key. Um, and even in the health sector, what we saw is, you know, billions of dollars being spent, you know, on bringing in, you know, different inputs, right? So you see medicine, you see even trying to bring in doctors, you know, supplies, but you would see the needle not really trending in the direction that you wanted to. And undercutting all of those things is leadership, right? Leadership and governance. If you don't have leaders that are strategic visionaries that understand, you know, complexities of what's happening on the ground, you can really think about, you know, how do we move the country forward, then really you're just throwing good money at bad, right? Because nothing will really change, as Omiwa had said. And so for me, going, um, you know, living in Nigeria, but working really across um, several West African countries, I saw that firsthand. And I think, you know, for us as, and for you guys as the future generation of leaders, is to really think about, you know, when you go there, how are you going to be strategic and how are you going to, like um, Camila said, you know, do you consider working, you know, in the public sector? And public sector, of course, has its own, I'll just speak from Nigeria's standpoint, has its own very deep frustration. <laughs> um, you, they may run you out of there, right? <laughs> but there's, you know, there's some people that have the grit and that are willing to do that. And there are other people maybe on the private sector side where you collaborate with the public sector, you get them to start thinking about, you know, how to design effective policy, think about how do we, how do we advance the country in a meaningful way? Um, so I think for me, that was the biggest thing that I saw. And that was the biggest frustration is like, hey, we could be so much further ahead of where we are, but you know, we haven't gotten the, fundament the fundamentals right. Um, I wanna say something um, about that point about systems and government. Um, so that's part of the reason why I joined IFC, because I thought that when I finished school, I would work directly in government. And then I thought, oh, because my, my mom had had experience in government and she really suffered. She totally, 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 totally suffered. And I saw I would never put myself in that situation, in a situation again, where I am, I am vulnerable. Um, and I have... I'm just really powerless and my life is almost just really hard to recover after that. So um, I found that working with the World Bank um, on the other side was, was good. I was able to influence um, change laws when we could and effect change. Um, and it was a very soft way of doing, of, of, of um, of, of making change. Um, the other experience that I've had now is, now that I'm running my own business, because I, I, I make uh, cosmetic products, um, it's just really, I mean, the route for getting approvals in Kenya um, through our body called the Kenya Bureau of Standards is, is like, it's insane. Um, so much corruption, people saying no for absolutely no reason. And you have to figure out how to navigate the system. Um, I think one thing that we have that is an advantage for all of us, wherever we are, is to just realize that we have power. So I just went to Twitter and I just wrote to them and my friend, my Kenyan friends thought I was crazy, but you know, I got the response and I got my product approved to sell now in the shops. And I wouldn't have done that if, I think sometimes if you don't have a different mindset. So that mindset can work for you and it helps you to be bold in situations where um, you won't accept the status quo. And I had said, if this doesn't work, actually, you know what? I think I know, um, let's say the cabinet secretary for this, because now it's the time. My friends are in power. I can call them and ask them, can you help me with this? I mean, you don't really want to go to that, that route because again, you don't want to be the one the business that is under the spotlight from government and everybody wants to crush you. So it calls for so much sensitivity, I don't know, diplomacy, cultural skills, <laughs> to be able to navigate the system. And, um, and for me, it's almost a wisdom that comes um, with life. So you have to also pick which battles you want to fight and which battles you don't want to fight. 
Um, and that's just something to keep in mind. You'll get frustrated and you just decide, am I going to fight the traffic battle or am I going to fight the bigger cabs battle? Let me focus on cabs, please, not traffic, you know? And, 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 and lastly, um, so I like one comment that Tomu said about creativity because I have a friend who's Latin American and she came to Nairobi, it was her first time in Sub-Saharan Africa, outside of South Africa. And she said, I kept saying, gosh, it's so chaotic. And she said, you know what? Actually, chaos is the mother of creativity. And you know, from then on, I have never looked at our chaos the same way again. I know that somewhere in that jungle, there is um, people making it, people hustling, solutions being found. And I think if you, you, you just need to adopt, think about life like that on the continent and you'll somehow make it. Uh, oh, thank you very much for your yeah, nice uh, responses. And so I think right now, before we transition to the second part, uh, I just want to you know, ask someone in the audience if they have a question. Yeah, you can come. Hello, I'm Matthew, nice to meet you guys. Um, I had a question for um, Wambu. You just mentioned about your Latin American friend who came to Nairobi for the first time. And for me, I'll actually uh, be going to Nairobi for the first time uh, this summer for a Swahili program. And so I was wondering if you have any advice. Uh, no, welcome. <laughs> look, um, look, you, are you, uh, um, look, Nairobi is, is, oh, you'll be coming in the summer. So just to let you know, we'll be having elections. <laughs> so those will be really, really interesting times. And this is a landmark. Uh, election for the country. Um, it's one of those ones that could make or break us, but I'm going to be optimistic. Um, look, Nairobi is a really vibrant, vibrant city. We have a fantastic um, social scene, art scene as well. Um, of course, there's the usual touristy things that you must do. Um, but I would say that um, there, are, there are wonderful pockets of communities around. And I don't know, just uh, give me a buzz when you come and uh, we can see how to connect. But I would say spend some time in, um, if you can, I don't know how long you're going to be able to make it, but um, spend some time in the Kenyan coast because that's where they really speak very, very, very good Swahili. And, um, and in Tanzania, if you can, just make a trip to Dar es Salaam or something because there, or Zanzibar, the, 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 the Swahili they speak is fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, so there is another, another question from the audience. Uh, oh, hi guys, uh, my name is Mumasi. Uh, I'm also Kenyan and I teach Marty Swahili. Um, <laughs> I, ha I, have a, I have a question for um, Tomiwa and Anuli. So when we mentioned that having money to support you know, her family was an important factor in choosing to go home. Um, so I wanted to also know like how, what role did money, the money you're going to add uh, play in making the decision to go back to Africa? Um, so like I said, I, I negotiated from here, from the US. Um, and for me, maybe because I was, I'd already had a career, you know, I was working as a nurse before and nurses, you know, they do pretty well in the US. So I figured, you know, now that I've earned this master's, I don't want to go back and be struggling. So I really had to use that as bargaining power and think about the value that I'm going to add to the organization. Um, and they saw that, you know, that's the reason why they offered me that job. So I would say, go back based on what your priorities are. You know, if there's a certain threshold that you say, I can't afford to work below this, then use that as your, use that as what you say, you may or nay to. Um, I also think, as Wambui said, it's really good to have some international experience. So if you can get some here, that would be great because it's leverage, right? You can now say, well, actually, I was making X, Y, and Z dollars here. And depending on you know where you're going, what the economic situation is like in Nigeria now, for example, as Tomiwa said, the current situation is pretty, economic situation is not great. So it is going to be very, very difficult get forex which is you know to make dollars unless you're getting it from an international organization that's so that's something to keep in mind but um so 
I would say that if you're trying to go back, maybe get some experience here first, know what it is you cannot afford to work under and use and fix that because I had some friends that said, well, you know, I'll just whatever. And they're very unhappy now. And I think you really need to be able to think long-term, you know, so do I want to be able to travel? Do I want to start a family? You know, what, what are the things that you want to do and what is it you have to make sure that your salary can afford you that. Now, I'm not saying working and money should be your only basis, but it should be something that you strongly consider because a lot of people will leave, you know, if they feel like they're not being compensated well. Um, okay, so I think um, Anuli's made sort of some really key points on there. I think a couple of considerations are, Now you, so pay will vary on the continent. And especially over the last few years, we've had a series of currency devaluations that have hit a lot of currencies across the continent. And so you might've moved back and, you know, started a job making $60,000 in Naira or, you know, Kenyan shillings, whatever the local currency is. Um, and then after sort of two, three devaluations, find that you're suddenly earning $40,000 or $35,000, you know, in equivalent, and it feels like you've actually gone back, you know, in time um, and not done as well for yourself. Um, now, the value of that money also differs. Um, and so the quality of life that you can get on the continent for an equivalent amount of money is often higher. Your taxes on the continent are frequently lower. Um, so those are considerations as well. Like Anuli said, if I were going to make this move and make it again, I would get the best job I can with all the leverage while sitting in the US. You know, I would play up whatever roles I'd had and like negotiate the strongest salary. Um, sometimes, depending on the company and the role, you can actually negotiate a salary that's either paid in dollars or benchmarked in dollars. That's fantastic. That's super, super helpful. Um, even if it's just pegged against the dollar, it means that if there's a devaluation, then they have to make an adjustment that brings you up back to level. Um, so that's valuable. Um, um, I, I think that yeah, that exchange rate thing is really, really critical to understand and to think deeply about. Um, the other, I think, point of consideration is, you know, do you want to make sixty thousand dollars in New York, or hundred thousand dollars, or I don't know, two hundred thousand dollars in New York, or do you want to make two hundred thousand dollars in Nigeria? And um, besides the fact that it will probably stretch further here. I guess, I'm sorry, the other flip side of the currency thing is if you're going to travel, then you're expo exposed back, you, you then get your dollar exposure again or global currency exposure, which means if you've taken a hit, you'll, you'll feel it every time you try to leave the country or you try to do things even in country that are dollar pegged. Um, but I think just to the final consideration of do you want to earn good money in the US or do you want to earn good money on the continent? I think, again, that then brings it back to what matters to you? What's your life path? What are the things that you want to do and change and experience in the world? Because um, I think you can make a pretty decent living in the US or any other Western country, um, but meaning wise, it may not mean as much to you as you know, earning the same thing or doing work that's more meaningful on the continent. Um, that is entirely open to every individual. Um, when I worked in New York, I thought I was doing work that was amazing. I was happy to do it. I didn't feel any need to go and save the world or anything, even here. And, um, and you know, please kudos to the people who actually are saving the world. Um, we need and respect and need more of you. Um, but I've always worked in entertainment and media and advertising in those spaces. And I thought I was doing great, you know, impactful work in New York. And I'm happy that in Nigeria, I've found an equivalent sort of, of work that I find fulfilling um, and I find meaningful. And so I think for every person, you know, you find you find the thing that brings you alive and then you figure out a way to get paid enough for it to live the life that you want to live from an economic perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I, we had another little question. Hello. Hello. Um, my name is Chris. Uh, my question was, uh, as a Colombia undergraduate students, we often think about having an impact on the continent uh, or back home, uh, even though it might not be there. Uh, so what would be your advice on how to do it and how to do it well? Like, how do we have impact 
home if we are not home. Thank you. I would like someone smarter than me to take this question. <laughs> well, I think you're all very smart. So <laughs> Um, but maybe I can speak. Um, and that's what I did before I moved back, right? So I shuttled back and forth. Um, and I think what's really important is to get plugged in. So use your connections, use your roots. You know, like I said, my grandparents is a hospital. And um, through that, I was able to use my connections to my New York hospital and say, hey, why don't we do medical missions? Let's partner with them and do medical missions, right? So that was one way in which I started to impact, you know, my community, well, my Nigerian community um, while I was abroad. Um, but there's so many different ways that you can do it. It's really to find what your passion is, to find, make sure that aligns with what the need is, because that's very, very important, not being prescriptive, but, you know, understanding what's going on on the ground and then find, trying to see how you can marry the two. Um, but I think it's really, really important to get plugged in. Um, I don't know if any of you are part of SPAN. I think I read, Omiwa, did you start SPAN? Someone? I did. You started SPAN, thank you. I was the president while I was there as well. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you for that. But um, SPAN is also another good way or whatever the, I don't know what the equivalent is for the undergrads, but um, you know, find a way to get plugged into the clubs that are, you know, focusing on the needs of subcontinent and really use that as a leverage while you're in school to do some meaningful work until you know you're able to now get a job and move back. Or if you don't move back, find a way really to marry your passions with the needs that are there. Um, there are many different ways, and there are many alumni that I'm sure would be happy to support you. And I also will offer my contact information at the end as well. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting question. I think each of us is trying to have impact wherever we are. When I think about what Anuli does and what Tomiwa does, and for me, impact always starts at a very personal level. So how you are and how you interact with people. Um, so definitely, um, do not discount that um, you, you have something to contribute to, even if it's to your friend or to your brother or to your sister or to somebody, um, there's that. And then I think that we've been very um, one track minded, but I think the way the world is now is that you can have, you can be a multi-passionate person. So <laughs> <laughs> it means that you can be doing this thing, but it, your passion is maybe education or giving libraries or uh, making a difference. Figure out what it is that, that will really excite you. So just a really small example. My, my youngest brother is really passionate about sustainability and trees. He is a tree hugger. Um, and he's been doing his PhD in the US for a long time. I mean, for a while now, he's back. He came back this year. But every, I swear, every time Wang is around, he's like buying trees from tree center, planting them on the streets of Nairobi, at the Arboretum. And the other day we were just walking through, uh, driving in one of the Nairobi suburbs. And he was like, oh yeah, that's my tree, that's my tree. He made us plant trees. In, in, in suburbs that are not green and um, that are lower, um, that are for poorer people because um, of the way Nairobi was, was, was built. So every one of us has planted trees at any one point in our lives. And I love that about Mwangi, that he's so passionate. He started as an NGO about trees. So he's always tweeting, he's doing things. And um, his whole idea is around involving youth. Um, when I think about what I do, my, um, what, what my business has done is that it, it has exposed me to just how much there is a need for, because uh, we have so many young people, but they need jobs. So how do you create meaningful work for them? Not just work, but also meaningful work, give them career paths, give them opportunities to, to thrive, help them meet their dreams. If somebody comes and says, will you be my referee? I want to go do my master's somewhere just do it, you know? Um, so I think there are very many ways of, of, of doing impact. One thing I think that 
we could do as African students um, and even alumni of Columbia is um, scholarships. And I know that a couple of us have been thinking about it, um, working with the alumni office about just having dedicated funding for needy students uh, who qualify um, to come to, 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 to Colombia directly from the continent. And I think that's, if we could figure out a way to manage that money well and, and, and have it managed well by Colombia, um, that would be a great thing that we could do. And the other thing, the last thing that I did when I was at CIPA, and maybe I know you did it. So as SPAN um, and the African students, we always mentored kids from Harlem. And it was really tough, I have to say, <laughs> at the beginning. But it was really, really, really gratifying spending time and just seeing the difference you've made in their lives over the last, like in the last year. Like I remember one time, one child was so difficult. He'd be like, tell me about Africa. Do you guys live on trees? You know, all those weird questions. And he was really aggressive and not pleasant. But we stuck it out. And um, by year two, when, when, when we brought the kids to, to Colombia and to school, I mean, the kid was like, you know what, I, I, I really am so inspired. I want to be an engineer. And that was just for me, it was enough. That was just enough to know that we had made a difference in, in a young kid, in a black, in the, lives, in the life of a black kid in, in the US, in New York, which is a really difficult place to survive if you're poor. Yes, thank you very much for your answer. And then, uh, so we're going to transition to the next part of our conversation today. And so this part, I'll just be asking, you know, some specific questions. Um, and I'll, so I'll, I'll start with like, a specific question to Tamiwa. And so uh, Tamiwa, we know that uh, you are the CEO of, of Big Cabo Media. And so um, I just wanted to know, like, what do you think is the biggest challenge that's the, oh, well, can, you, can you please yeah, you know, tell the audience about like Big Cabo Media? And also what it does, and also like the biggest challenge that the technology industry faces today, and like what's like how is the company dealing with that? And like how is it helping uh, in coping with the challenge? Okay. So I run a company called Big Cabal Media. We are a digital publisher. We publish uh, two publications, one is Tech Cabal. Um, and another is Zico code. So Tech Cabal aims to provide uh, sort of like the context on the content, the data, the events around technology in Africa. Uh, we speak to founders, to entrepreneurs, we speak to the technology ecosystem on the continent, as well as to investors globally and business people who are trying to understand how technology is changing the continent. Um, it's one of the leading publications covering tech in Africa, and we're kind of growing our footprint uh, to be more and more global for people who are looking to understand the continent. Uh, we have a publication called Zikoko, which is quite youth focused. Uh, it's playful, it's a bit Buzzfeed, beats Refinery29, very, very loved, daring. We cover topics nobody else will cover. Um, and it's really been interesting to try to build a 21st century digital publishing, digital media business on the continent. So you have some of the same problems that challenges that there are globally, which is media's business models are in flux. Uh, and then you have sort of unique African challenges. Um, I've talked about the market as a big one. Um, really big issue affecting building the kind of company that we are building and definitely affecting the technology industry on the continent is talent. And so we have lots and lots of, you know, people coming out of universities, coming out of secondary schools on an annual basis, it's really serious unemployment, but um, you still have massive talent shortages because our curriculums haven't been over haven't been over overhauled um, in far too long. Um, we're investing far too little into our universities, our secondary school programs, into our education system in general. And so you are graduating people who actually aren't capable of serving the market, um, and that's really starting to show in terms of uh, Africa's tech scene is booming. Uh, there's each year more and more investment coming onto the continent. Sometimes, you know, the scale and the pace of it is just incredibly dramatic. You're starting to have your first exits, your first unicorns. 
Um, I think last year we went from two to eight unicorns within the span of one year. And by the end of this year, there will certainly be more, lots more um, across the continent. Um, but all of those people are fighting for talent. There's an ugly, ugly poaching you know, competition going on. Um, most startups are starting to hire further afield. So for us, we went sort of remote during lockdown. We've gone back to a hybrid setup. But these days we'll hire from all around the world because um, sometimes we just can't find the sounds we need locally. And so you go looking for it wherever it is you can find. Um, that does then set up the thing of you're earning your revenue in Naira and sometimes hiring people in other markets um, in dollars or whatever other currencies. That can be tricky. Um, but overall, I feel blessed to be in a space that's moving forward and a company that I think is doing some quite special things. And I think within the tech industry, for those who are interested in it, I think there's a lot of really exciting things happening. FinTech has sort of taken the bulk of investment over the last few years, but I think there are more ed tech plays happening more now. There are more health tech plays happening now. And people are sort of spending money a bit further afield. Um, all of which is good for the industry um, and will mean that uh, a wider range of problems get solved in the near future than previously have been. I think that's all good. Yeah, thank you very much. And also, I, I just had a like, short follow up about that. Like, do you, uh, by any chance, like, offer internships to students? Like, any student will be interested, you know, to, you know, come to. What are they? Like, would you be willing to offer them an internship or something? Um, yes, we do take interns. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I, yeah, I, I can share my email address um, if people are interested. Yes, we take interns. Um, we, pay, we pay interns a stipend. And um, we, yeah, I think, yeah, we do. So if, if it's an area of interest, please do reach out. Ah, and we'll people. Yeah. If there are any J school people here, we're always, like, we're always hiring. We're looking for journalists. We're looking for... Uh, people in that space. So yeah, if, uh, yeah, maybe I'll drop some links in the chat for, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the second question that I have is for, um, uh, yeah, it's for Anuli. And so the, the question that I had is just like, um, yeah, it's so like you mentioned that you are, you know, working, you know, back and forth between like uh, the, the United States and also um Nigeria and so I I was wondering like do you like like what's what's the benefit of like you know working in two different places and like how do you use the skills from one place to like extend to the other one and like what's what makes you excel in how, how do you navigate that? That's a great question um and just to maybe clarify before I moved moved back full time to Nigeria I was um I was shuttling back and forth. And then for the last five years, I was working solely in Nigeria, although I had family in the US, so I'd come back often. Um, but what I would, and now I'm again, based in the US, but because, really because of my husband, he's doing grad school here. So that's the reason why we moved back. But um, to answer that, I think um, there are a lot of parallels between what you see and um, it's health wise, I'll, I'll use that because that's that's where my um, experience lies. And even education wise, um, there are a lot of parallels in what you see in um, lower income neighborhoods in the US and what you see back on the continent. So I was able to use a lot of those um, experiences and they're not necessarily cut and paste, right? You still need to have, you still need to have context, you still need to be able to understand what exactly are the, the issues that are being faced by the community that you're serving at that time. But I was able to, for me to excel is to think not so much, oh, I haven't worked here or I haven't lived here before, but what are some of the things that I'm seeing that I've seen in my experience abroad that I'm now seeing here as well? And how do I now use my local knowledge? How do I use my professional experience? How do I use the personal interactions that I've had to now address those issues that I'm seeing here. So for me, um, I think it was just being able to think more broadly about some of the things that I was um, 
you know, some of the health issues that I was seeing, some of the education issues that I was seeing, some of the social determinants that I was seeing, and not be so restricted. Because a lot of times people will say to you, well, you've never worked here, you know, or you don't have experience here. But that's not always true, right? I, I can now say, well, you're right, I haven't worked here. But what I can tell you is that, you know, a lot of the data that I've seen or a lot of the experience that I've seen actually draw similarities to what I'm seeing now. Um, and being able to just to communicate that for people that have um, confidence in the work that you're going to do is really, really important. Um, and I say, you asked me what helped me to excel. I think when Bowie said this, it's being excellent, right? Just deciding that you're not going to take shortcuts, whatever you put your name on, whatever you are asked to represent, that's me, right? So I don't want to put something out there where it's shoddy work or something that I can't stand and say that I'm proud of. Um, and that even means in the small things. So that means in conversation that you're having, to maybe a paper that you're going to submit for pre presentation that you're going to do, make sure that just because your colleagues are compromising, you don't compromise because at the end of the day, it's your reputation. Um, and you always want to have a reputation for excellence. Um, and that's that's what I would say as words to live by, um, especially if you're going back um, as both of my fellow panelists have said, you'll see a lot of compromising. Um, you'll see a lot of, you know, oh, you don't have to do this. And, you know, you'll see different work ethics. And if you want to advance wherever you go, you don't want to have that attached to your name. Um, and people may not say that to you, but it's the truth. I, and I'll give you one example. I remember when I first moved back, a family friend had said to me, don't you want to go work in, um, in the Ministry of Health, they can go. They can go chop your money. Essentially, they can go. They can go and get your your, your cut. And I'm like, no, I can never do that. Like that's just. I don't want that type of reputation following me. And two, that really undercuts and undermines everything that we're trying to do, right? So if you're just thinking long term, some of the things that people are asking you to do are very short term, and they really just compound the problem even more. So if you think about you know, in 20 or 25 years, do I want my children to live here? Do I want my family to still be here? And if you think like that, you'll say, I'm not going to compromise because we all have to be here. We have to make sure that we have a strong foundation and a system that works. So that would be my advice to you, Frank, and to anybody else really that's thinking about going back stick to your ethics and stick to your morals. They will always help you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And also, like, uh, I just wanted to kind of quick follow up on that. Uh, I, you know, we saw this. Uh, we were recognized like in 2020 by the world, like WHO, UNFPA, and Women in Global Health uh, as one of like uh, one of the hundreds global outstanding women nurses and uh, midwife leaders. So I just wanted to know, like, what's what do you think is like the biggest challenge that's the healthcare system? especially on the African continent species at the moment? Um, I think it's what I've um, said before, leadership. Um, and that really cuts across everything, right? So when you think about poor leadership, you think about mismanagement of funds, you think about the brain drain, and you may not necessarily think about how it's connected, but in reality, when you really study and understand the system, you see that because of poor leadership, there's poor remuneration, there's horrible systems where, you know, you go to the hospital, there's no running water, there's no light, you know, all the things that you may have, you know, studied in school, or maybe you came from abroad and you've, you decided you want to go back home. You're not really seeing that, that it creates a lot of frustration. And as Swamiwa said, you'll see a lot of excellent doctors and nurses in the U.S. are excelling, but you, it would be very difficult for you to find them, convince them to go back because of what this the foundation is not there. So I think in the health system, and I think almost in all systems, to be honest with you, leadership foundation. Um, and I think that is a real challenge that we're having. You know, improper leadership, you know, improper, improper governance is really just destroying, uh, you know, the systems that are, that should be in place. So, um, I think 
the best way to tackle this is to really look at, you know, how do we strengthen leadership? How do we strengthen governance? And then you can now begin to work on all the other things, the building blocks that come as a result of that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and also, I just wanted to also remind our uh, Zoom audience, it's just in case they have any questions, they can always uh, use the Q&A function and then we'll be able to see their questions and also incorporate them. And okay, uh, to continue, um, I have like another you know, set of specific questions to on going now. And then, uh, so, so the question is, um, uh, like, I think, uh, when, when we were talking, like she mentioned that she's been like, working uh, in different you know, companies. So it's within the finance and also agriculture uh, sectors, but like it's different companies, different uh, uh, countries. So I just wanted uh, to know like how, like what is career mobility like? Because you know, sometimes, like, like I, I study computer science, you know, and you know, sometimes I, when I see myself like at 50 years old, I don't know if I'll be able to like write codes or, you know, <laughs> do anything that's related to computer science. You know, I just wanted to know like, oh, what, what do you think is career mobility like uh, on the African continent? Like, are you able like, to like switch jobs? Because, you know, I think at some point I'll probably want to switch and do something different. Yeah, and I just wanted to know your opinion on that. So I am around that age that you mentioned, <laughs> when, <laughs> whether you'll be writing code or not. <laughs> and so I'm in the process of reinventing myself for the second half of my life. Um, yeah, I turned 50 this year. So I think, okay, look, I said I'm mobile and I think I've been mobile in my life as well and in my career choices. Part of the reason why, um, I change and, and, and actually I look at the pattern, it's like a seven year pattern. It's like seven years I get bored. So I want to do something different. But as we learned in school, the most important thing is what are the skills that are transferable, right? And there's a dot in my life that connects. So that's one thing I'm going to say, you, must, you should always look at um, what is transferable for you. Secondly, I think right now in life in Africa and across the world, you have to be able to be flexible. There is no one is joining a company and working with them for 10, I mean, I don't know, like 25 years. It's that that's really not happening anymore. And things are moving and changing so fast. So it's really important for you to keep to keep to keep pace with 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 the changes that are going on in your industry. And that actually then gives you and allows you to be, to be mobile from a career perspective because um, you, you start working in this space and then you discover actually, um, I really like tech. Um, let me see how I can apply my skills in tech and let me see what I can do in this space. Um, so, um, the way I think of surviving on the continent now, and I mean, even I think of myself also because there's very little, there's not much opportunity for formal employment, you know, not as much because the private sector is not that big and not that deep. So you have to find a way to be flexible. For me, mobility also means that you have to be willing to be mobile somehow in your life so like what everyone has done here, they've moved from, physically moved from their location. And um, that, that helps with, with, um, with career mobility. And um, SIPA helped me switch as well. So I was able to switch from being a journalist to getting into the international development space. How, um, it, it made it easier. I think I would still have been able to do it if um, <clears throat> I had not gone to grad school, but it might just have been tougher. Less doors would have uh, not so, or doors wouldn't have opened so easily for me. So that helped me switch careers. And the other thing with mobility is a lot of life, I think now is also about networking. And unfortunately that's the truth. So um, just keep your networks at every point in your life 
don't burn bridges um, because uh, we we help each other and people help each other. So I don't know if that answers your question, um, but at every point, especially the last um, since Colombia, I have worked in the international development space. So even when I when I joined KPMG, I was still doing international development work. Um, that's just a different type of work. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, uh, yeah, that's definitely answers the question. And uh, so, like, uh, like short follow up on that, and then we'll take there was a question in the, the Q and A. So we'll we'll take that after this. Um, so the, the follow up that I have about that is, you know, like even Anuli talked about the, the fact. I think Anuli talked about the fact that she's been uh, at SIPA when you were what well, like when I think you were president of, of Span. Like, uh, can, can you can you tell us about like? Uh, why why you like what motivated you to create uh, the group and also like what did you did you know what goal did you have in mind for the group? Sure. So that's a great question and I love it. Um, so when I when I when I joined when I joined SIPA, um, SIPA had two two student two African student associations. There was Africa Economic Forum, a, a no Africa Economic Network or something like that. And um, there was ASAD, students, African students of African descent or something like that. Anyway, there were two. Um, and then within SIPA, there were very many different uh, student associations. So the students from, from Latin America had their own student association, the Asian students had um, different. And you know, the Africans were the only ones who were divided. So that was the first big thing for me. It, how is this happening? Why are we so divided? And we were so tiny. So about, we were not more than 30 out of a student body of 300, uh, both uh, doing MIA and um, MPA. So that, that, was, that was the first thing. Then secondly, um, that division was just not good. It, it, there were, the vibes were not good within this, the, even between the African students themselves. So the guys who were in the, in the network, um, they had a bit of a superior attitude and the guys in the students of African descent also covered um, uh, students from the Caribbean um, and the diaspora, like the, the sad black people. Um, so it, it was just not good for the community and I really hated it. Um, and so when we had a chance to be leaders, our student community, our student, our year in, um, the, we the ones who graduated in 2006, we really got along like a house on fire. We were all really united and it was really awful because what happened was, um, then the, the, the leadership at the, net, at the network group tried to still drive the division by creating a wedge between us. Um, and so we had a chat amongst ourselves and we said, look, this is not gonna work. Let's actually wait for them to go. And then, um, so Kwabena was, was the head of Africa Economic Network or something like that. And I was the president of Assad. And, but we agreed we're going to, as soon as they leave, the first thing we're doing is we're going to match the association. We even had a chat with, um, with Karen, who was um, part of um, the administration then, and we informed her what our plans were. Of course, the former students were really disappointed, but what we ended up doing was creating a great home um, for everyone who was Black, um, both Africans and in the diaspora, um, for all the students at SIPA who, who, um, who are interested in, in African affairs. And then we created, I mean, we then built the, the, the Africa Economic Forum into something really amazing, bigger and better and impactful. I mean, I see now it's in the same league as, as the Harvard Business School Africa Conference. And I think that would never have happened if we had continued the way we were before. We also had very good relationships with the African students in the business school 
and with the law school and everywhere. So that was the inspiration behind it. It was my first very political act. <laughs> I was not liked at all, um, but I'm really happy and proud about the legacy um, um, of SPAN. And I still have the documentation, by the way, somewhere in my file, I keep thinking I need to send these files back to, to Colombia so that <laughs> The, the span leadership can have them. But that's that's the backstory. So please don't split, don't backstab each other, just be united. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be united. Yes, thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah, and also, uh, well, I'm going to give an opportunity to uh, Bethlehem, who has a question uh, in the chat. Uh, let me see how to. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Bethlehem, but I'm going to uh, read the question. So his question is, how are you creating your own community as cosmopolitan citizen whose views does not necessarily gel with the culture on the, or the culture on the ground? And then how are you making meaningful relationships outside of work and family? And then how are you honoring the cosmopolitan diverse aspects of yourself in African contexts? Yes, very well. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to answer this question. Um, so I think uh, one, Africa is quite cosmopolitan. I mean, at least our big cities are quite, quite cosmopolitan. And you will have, um, in major cities, you have you know, a good art scene, a good music scene. You have you know, a good, really interesting cultural scenes. Um, I can speak for Lagos. I can speak for Nairobi. I can speak for Dakar, uh, Johannesburg. Um, a range of cities that I've spent time in on the continent where they actually are sort of like excellent cosmopolitan scenes. Um, I remember one of the reasons I actually became an entrepreneur in Nigeria was a dissatisfaction with the music options. Um, I was moving from New York and I, you know, I'd enjoyed sort of like uh, the independent rock scenes, or the jazz scene, the R&B scene. So um, it may not be quite the same in the sense that, you know, if you're, if you're used to a range of American artists, you're not going to find the same ones. In, in, in bars and clubs and uh, uh, but um, across Africa there are robust music scenes. South African house is incredible. They've an incredible music scene. Nigeria's music scene is like amazing. Our art scene in terms of the visual arts is incredible. Um, we have um, in Lagos, you know, uh, there's a fashion there's a fashion season where it's a whole month of fashion shows. There's an art season where it's a whole month of some of the best sort of like galleries on the continent being present in Lagos and sort of curators doing incredible stuff. Uh, there's an amazing fashion scene. And so I think the, you'll find that they're cosmopolitan. There's increased, at least over the last sort of five to 10 years, I feel like there's been a much larger uh, movement of Africans traveling on the continent and actually sort of spending more time from a vacation perspective, from a tourism perspective on the continent. Um, and I mean, like I've been doing a lot more of that and I found it quite, quite rewarding. Um, it's an interesting continent and a diverse continent in a lot of ways. In terms of views and sort of cultural perspectives, um, I mean, a lot of Africa can still be quite, quite conservative, but you'll find, especially in big cities, but across the entire continent really, uh, that there are pockets of people who are quite progressive, who are quite alternative in their perspectives in their approach to the world. Um, I run one of the publications that Nick Cabal publishes is the Coco, which is extremely progressive and sort of tackles a range of topics and ideas and cultural positions that are not necessarily mainstream, but are progressive. And you can find, you know, through, through publications like that, through communities like that, like communities like the ones that we build, um, you can find sort of um, like-minded people. Uh, and build relationships and friendships. I will actually say that this is one of my concerns when I first moved to Nigeria, was that would it be, would I find a cosmopolitan enough scene? Would I find enough people who are progressive? Um, I, I will. <laughs> uh, this is actually the second time I'm speaking to students in New York this week. Yesterday I spoke to some people at the new school. Um, I consider myself fairly liberal. Um, but um, I have found that by US standards these days, I'm probably fairly conservative. I've been on the continent for over a decade now. Um, but um, I think you'll find that there are 
many progressive people on the continent, many people with with a wide, with independent um, approaches. And you'll find, I mean, you'll find conservatives of a different stripe as well. And so I think the concern about it being cosmopolitan enough, um, I think if you're open-minded and know that it will not be like for like in terms of the scenes that you will engage, then you will find wonderful people, you will find, you know, rich cultural scenes and um, yeah, uh, and meaningful friendships outside of work and family. That's my experience anyway. Yeah. Sure, um, I can speak. Um, so I had, um, I love the question because it's, it's so important to your own personal well-being. Um, so I had a group of friends uh, before I left Kenya in 1998. And um, they're my sisters. We've been, we've done life together. That's what we say. Um, we're a group of about seven of us, been through husbands, divorce, children, birth, everything. And these girls have visited me everywhere I have lived. Um, and because of that, when I came back home, I didn't have many friends. It was really tough. I only had family and my girlfriends. And because they grew with me and we grew up together in, in that sense, even if it was a virtual long distance sense, and um, I kept in touch with them, it gave me some, it, it helped ease my way back home. That said, um, I think it's just important to first of all accept that you're cosmopolitan and you are a global citizen. You have to accept that in your head because people will label you. Um, they will also label you and make it sound like a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing. I think you are who you are and you are a result of your experiences. So really just accept yourself, accept, accept that bit about you and be very okay with it and do not apologize. Uh, for that at all in any way. Um, I got into trouble a lot of times in my last place of work because I used to speak my mind. And when I left, I told the CEO, you know, I didn't, when I speak my mind, I know you guys are really shocked, but it's not because I, I am quarreling with anybody. It's, it's really because I have the interests of the farm um, and I want to see uh, the best for the farm but you guys take it so personally um, and you think I'm just fighting, but actually, no, I have no interest in fighting with anybody. I have, my interest is in what is best for the farm. So you have to be aware that not everybody's going to, to like you, like your personality, like the way you handle. Yeah, so it's not that easy. So find your, just find your crowd um, and take your time to find the people that you can gel with. And um, lastly, having said that, I think there is something to be said for wisdom and life. So when I moved to Tanzania in 98, Tanzania then was really different from what it is now. And it, was, it has always been slightly different from Kenya. So Dar es Salaam was a very Muslim city. Um, they didn't have career women, yeah, like that. Um, and I was also young and I was a journalist and I had to produce stories. So culturally, and, and Kenyans are brought up very differently from Tanzanians. So Tanzanians at home always say shikamo, which is a very respectful greeting. And it's almost like you're almost bowing to the person. And Kenyans, I greet my father, hello. You know, I, I, I will not say shikamo. So every time, even in business meetings, I would, People would expect me to say shikamo, but as soon as I said shikamo, I realized I will never get the story that I need because the minister will be patting my head like a little girl and, <laughs> and the conversation just goes all right completely. So I made a decision then, even when I speak to the president, I'm gonna address him as Mr. President, you know, and I got away with it because I was Kenyan and they say this rude Kenyan girl, but my, I was there to get a story and that's what I had to do. That's it. Now that I'm much, much older, I can, I can let some things pass and I don't mind saying Shikamo because I will, I will still find a way to get what I want. 
So that's what I mean by, by wisdom. Um, there are some cultural nuances that you have to just be careful about. And I think you just pick, pick your battles and know when to speak up, know when not to speak up, I would say. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for your, uh, your answer. Uh, they were really great. And I think these were really uh, good notes to you know, end our meeting on, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, I, I think this was, this was really great. Uh, I think uh, the ADG board has learned a lot from you and you know it's been it's been good and uh, the good thing is um uh, we'll be able to maybe you know ask like other students you know couldn't make it today because of exams because we're doing exams now we also have a chance to like look at the video and you know it's better. so thank you very much uh i was wondering whether i had some closing words uh, for us Thank you, Frank. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague, Lillian, uh, to close for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Ambui. Thank you, our panelists. That was wonderful. A lot of uh, talk points and uh, wisdom there. I was listening so keenly. I've picked up a lot. It's been um, personal to me. Thank you so much. I think this was this was timely for me, especially. So I want to really appreciate your your contributions, your support to the center. This is awesome. Thank you, uh, Frank. That was really, really good work. You've moderated so well with a lot of enthusiasm. Thank you so much. We really appreciate. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, David, for the efforts you always put to ensure that we have such wonderful uh, webinars and sessions. This is really great. And to our audience, uh, it was wonderful having you today. Um, we really appreciate your time. We don't take it for granted that you take your two hours to come and listen. And I know you've not left out empty. There is something, there's a lot of wisdom you have picked from these sessions. And uh, Pauline, we could have another one <laughs> again. We have really learned a lot. Thank you so much to all of you. And I want to wish you a wonderful um, evening, I think morning for those in US, evening for those in Kenya, Nigeria. Anulia, I don't know if you're in Nigeria, it should be um, I think five. <laughs> no, I'm in the US, so morning for yeah, me. <laughs> so it's morning. Thank you, Paul. It was wonderful to also have you. Thank you for honoring our event. And uh, we look forward to hosting you again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bye. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Well done. Bye, fellow panelists. I'll be reaching yeah, out. Yeah, really nice to meet you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.